Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for showing up to my talk, even though it's the last slot. I'm happy uh, some of you haven't made it to Prata yet, so I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Stefan Hanreich, and I'll be talking about building a hypervisor firewall with an F tables and Rust today. So some short stuff about me. I've been working as a software engineer for 10 years almost. So I think almost 10 years, maybe 11. And I've been working the last two years at Proxmox, where I'm mainly working on the software-defined networking and firewall stack. So before we start, I want to talk some. I want to show you, uh, talk about some general stuff for an F table. So it's been available since 2014, which is kernel version 3.13. So it had its 10-year anniversary this year in January. Um, it aims to provide a unified interface for NetFilter functionality, so there have been a lot of tools like uh, IP tables and IP6 tables, and NF tables uh, aims to provide a unified interface for NetFilter functionality. It is uh, evaluated inside a, uh, inside a VM, inside the kernel actually, so it's quite similar to eBPF in that regard that some of you might have heard about. So it's a purpose-built VM that has a very reduced instruction set and a very, uh, some registers and a very reduced scope. And the way it actually works, the user space tool and F tables, it compiles the rules that you are writing into byte code for that specific VM. And that gets then executed inside the kernel. And that has the upside that if you wanted, for instance, to so add a new protocol, you do not have to patch the kernel, but rather you just um, patch the user space utility to emit some uh, additional bytecode uh, that just gets imported into the kernel. So uh, one interesting features uh, that I'll be talking about a bit later is NF tables provides generic data structures that can be used in your rule sets that can also be dynamically updated. And also an interesting feature is it provides atomic and partial updates, which wasn't really possible before. So as I've already said, NF tables aims to combine quite a few tools. As, as you might know, there's IP tables, there's IP6 tables. So if you want to IPv4 or IPv6 filtering, you have to use had to use two different tools. There's EB tables if you want to do layer two or bridge filtering, ARP tables for ARP, and of course there's many different IP tables extensions such as IP sets. And to show you how NF tables combines those stuff here is a scary looking graph with lots of errors and uh, lots of hooks, sorry. Um, but the main takeaway here is you can see there are two different uh, types of tables, one for IP traffic and one for bridge traffic. And it provides separate hooks for bridge traffic or IP traffic. So it provides a way to organize your rule set. So let's say you had some rules for bridge traffic that is in you know, on virtualized network infrastructure and you can also create rules uh, for traffic that's going to your host. And also, some of you might have noticed there's those two uh, green things here for ingress and egress. It also uh, provides a raw table. So uh, you can also hook actually to raw network traffic before, before it leaves uh, like the network stack into the driver or before uh, uh, after it enters like from the driver and it's directly coming out. So how many of you have actually a uh, general idea of an F tables? How many of you have actually written an F tables rules already? So, okay, that's quite a few, but there's also, I think, more hands that haven't um, shown up. So I wanna maybe do a short introduction on how an F tables rules are structured uh, before we can get our feet wet with writing more complex rule sets. So the top level, uh, the top level object in an F tables is always a table. Uh, a table contains like every other object like chains, but also I've talked about generic data structures like set or maps and uh, it always has a type. So in this case, it's inet type. This means it can filter IPv4 or IPv6 traffic at the same time. If you wanted to do like bridge filtering, then there's a bridge type, there's an ARP type, there's a net type, like there's several types. And of course, everything, every object in an F tables has a name. In this case, it's my table, but you can use it to reference it later on. Tables, uh, probably the most important thing that tables can contain are chains. And chains are containers for rules. But there's some uh, additional properties that you can define for chains. 
there's usually a type. Uh, when we're writing a firewall, of course, the most interesting type is filter because it's used for packet filtering. But there's also other types like uh, for network address translation or for packet mangling, if you re want to rewrite some parts of the packet. And if it's a base chain, so in, this is a base chain, all those definitions you usually only have to provide for base chains. But you can also provide chains that you can only jump into, then you don't need any of those definitions. But for base chains, you have to define a type, a hook. As you've seen before, there are many different hooks. And you have to uh, tell an F-tables, of course, at which point in the NetFilter lifecycle you wanted to hook. In this case, it's input. And also, you can uh, give a priority. So with IP tables, you only had like one base chain at every hook, like input, forward, output, and so on. But he, with an F-tables, you can define infinitely many chains uh, at a hook. And the priority governs like in which order those chains get executed. So the lower the priority, the earlier the chain gets executed. And also a very interesting feature for this is that there are certain points in the NetFilter lifecycle uh, at certain priorities um, where, for instance, contract gets executed. So there's a specific priority for contract. So if you wanted your chain to execute before contract, like, for instance, if you wanted to change some contract information, you would give it the priority so that it runs before contract. And you can also define a default policy. So every base chain has to have a default policy. If a packet doesn't match any of the rules contained inside the chain, um, then it will execute the default policy. So in this case, drop. A chain uh, can contain rules. So in this case, it's a relatively simple rule. It says if the source address of the packet is 1001, and if it goes to the uh, TCP port 80, then we want to accept the packet, right? And if the default policy was dropped, and this was the only rule, and the packet wa was coming from some other IP or to some other port, then the packet would get dropped. So I've talked about data structures. One such, such data structure that is available in F tables is a set. So um, sets, you probably know from programming, they usually have a type. In this case, it's IPv4 address. And they also contain elements, of course. And sets are usually uh, used to match for containment. So in this case, you have all um, local IP ranges. So if you wanted to check if a packet is coming from a local IP address, then you would just match against this set. And then, yeah, take whatever action you want to take. There are also maps. You probably also know maps from programming. They have like a key and a value. And of course, the key has to have a type as well. Value has to have a type as well. And you can use it to pro uh, look, up, like look up the key and get some value in return. So very similar to a dictionary or a map in your programming language. And one last thing before we get our feet wet are concatenations. So concatenations are a very interesting feature that have been introduced with, I think, kernel version 4.14 or something. Uh, anyway, you can take two values and concatenate them together and make like one value out of it. So in this case, we take the IP address and the port and concatenate them together, and then we can match on both values at the same time. OK. Since the talk is called building, huh? what's happening here? Ah, I think I touched the cable. Oh, no. Huh? Oh, no. Great. Hmm? Sorry? Uh, no, I actually turned it off before, and it's just uh, the 
cable is a bit wobbly, the HDMI connector, so... Great. So here we're back again. This is our virtualized network environment. Um, so usually in a hypervisor, you usually have VMs. The VMs have a tap interface and they're usually connected to a bridge. So this is like a very simple example where you have two VMs, each VM has a tap interface and they're both connected to the same bridge, bridge zero. And there are different uh, ways how the traffic can flow, of course, in this environment. I wanna uh, talk a bit about all the different ways and how we can use NF tables to um, write firewall rules for the different kind of traffic flows inside the VM. So the simplest thing, of course, is outgoing guest traffic, right? So you have a VM and some traffic is coming out of the VM and you wanna do some checks on the VM traffic. So in hypervisors, you do not necessarily trust the operating system that is running inside the VM. So Basically, the guest can do anything and you want to maybe put some checks and balances on packets before they go out to the bridge. So one thing you might want to do is prevent max spoofing. So when we go back to a nice scary graph, there's only one thing highlighted here, that is the uh, ingress hook. So the ingress hook is running almost immediately after the packet comes out of the driver. So it's like very early, even before like the packet runs through the whole net filter and the pre-routing and everything. So you see the raw packets coming out of the driver. There are also, this is before packets are reassembled. So if you have fragmented packets, then uh, you will see each packet on its own, but not reassembled. This is important, for instance, when you want to do layer four filtering because of course with layer four, those packets could be fragmented. So it's not, not really possible to do layer four filtering at the ingress hook. But the upside of the ingress hook is um, that it's very performant. Since we're doing this before the whole Linux network stack is running basically, um, it's a lot more performant. I don't know if you maybe know TC, it's very comparable to TC, but of course, um, with TC, you can do additional stuff like queue management and so on. But in general, yeah, it's, it's very comparable. So um, I included this because it shows one feature, um, mainly that you can do ARP matching and layer two matching at the same time, right? As I said, and F tables uh, unifies all those stuff. So just in uh, one chain, you can just check for the uh, source address, the source MAC address, and also for the source MAC address inside the ARP packet. And if it doesn't conform to the MAC address of the tab interface that I gave the VM, then of course we drop the traffic. This is for instance, uh, for preventing ARP flooding, like someone could just send an ARP packet that says, oh, those 10,000 IP addresses belong to this guy, and then everyone will send the traffic to the VM and that can cause denial of service attack, for instance. Another thing that we might want to prevent, I'm sure some of you might have already dealt with it, our rogue DHCP servers. So if someone like decided, oh no. Okay, I'll try my best not to touch the adapter again. It seems a bit wonky. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, rogue DHCP servers. So DHCP is a layer four protocol. Um, and as I've said before, the ingress hook is quite unsuited to trying to match layer four traffic because of course packets can still be fragmented and so on. So we go one step further when um, a packet uh, comes out of the network driver, uh, NF tables checks if the device is actually uh, a member of a bridge. And if it is, it enters the pre-routing chain of the bridge table. So uh, the pre-routing chain of the bridge table seems like a good place to check for this. And uh, I've talked before uh, about sets and concatenations, right? 
and we can also put concatenations inside of a set. So DHCP, those are the um, source and destination ports, the UDP source and destination ports that DHCP servers usually use. One is for IPv6, one is for IPv4. And with this, we can just write one rule that says, uh, get the source port of UDP of the UDP packet, get the destination port of the UDP packet, and if it's contained inside the set, then drop it. So we drop basically all DHCP server traffic. And the nice thing about this is, this is a constant time evaluation. So let's say we had like 1000 possible DHCP ports, then we would just uh, define the set, write the rule, and it would just do a simple lookup. So it's constant time. And we could also go one step further. Of course, we can concatenate as many things as we like. So in this case, we add the protocol as well and uh, write rules like this, where we, add UDP, uh, where we add the protocol, the source port, and the destination port. So another interesting thing is, when you're doing stateful firewalling, you're usually using some form of uh, contract. So contract, of course, means connection tracking. It stores the source IP address, the source port, the destination IP address, and so on. And with marks, you can mark actually the contract flows and then match it to VMs. So for instance, for the VM1, you could do uh, mark it with one. For the VM2, you can mark it with two. And then when looking up in the contract table, you can just filter by the contract mark and check um, check which VM the traffic flow actually belongs to without having to resort to stuff like IP addresses and so on. And here we are using a map where the key is the name of the interface and the value is the mark we want to set for a contract. So we can uh, write the rule like this, uh, set the CT mark and look up the interface name that, uh, for the current packet, look inside the map um, which value is stored for the interface and then set the respective contract mark. And again, as you can imagine, in a hypervisor, we could have like 100 or even 1,000 tap interfaces at the same time. But uh, irregardless of how many tap interfaces you have, you have just one rule and constant time lookup. So irregardless, this scales like with constant time instead of linear time. And another nice thing is, of course, hypervisors are not a static environment. So there's constantly interfaces uh, getting added or interfaces getting removed. And we don't want to update our firewall rules all the time when new interfaces come up. So the nice thing about the data structures is we can just insert new elements or remove old elements from the command line without having to change our rules. So in this case, let's say we had a VM3 that has a new tab interface and we wanted to also add a contract mark for that interface, then we just add an entry to the map and we're done. We don't have to change anything um, in the rule set. So now that we are sure that the outgoing VM traffic is somewhat conforming to what we're expecting, we can look at east-west traffic, so traffic going from one VM to another. Um, and in this case, we want to do like a simple ACL. So let's say we had like two VMs and we want to say, okay, traffic can flow between those two VMs, but not uh, those other two VMs. So for instance, if I had like a web server and the database server and the cache server on the same bridge, for instance, and the web server wants to talk to the database server and the cache server, but maybe you don't want the uh, database server and the cache server to be able to talk to each other because they don't need to. And in our hooks, we go one step further. So right, we had the pre-routing chain when it enters the bridge and then it's checking, is the traffic getting forwarded to another port on the bridge? And if it does, then we enter the forward chain of the bridge. And here, uh, two interesting things. Of course, we can also use concatenation in the keys of the map. So here we have the tap interface one and tap interface two as the key. And another interesting thing is we can use verdicts as values in maps. 
so we can store accept or drop or reject. And this then enables us to write a relatively simple rule that says, check the input interface where the packet is coming from, check the output interface where the packet is getting routed to, and look up what verdict you should uh, take for that packet. But this is, of course, uh, really binary. So this is like a yes or no approach. But sometimes you only want to allow specific traffic between two VMs. So what you can also do is you have a jump instruction. So you can, uh, instead of just accepting or dropping, you can jump into a chain and in the chain have like very sophisticated rules, let's say, okay, only allow traffic to port 80 or only allow UDP traffic or whatever. And this feature is actually really neat because as you can imagine, if you have lots of VMs and lots of different port combinations, writing rules before was like really difficult because for every combination you had to write at least one rule. And with maps, you can just write one map, look in the map, uh, where's the traffic coming from, where's the traffic going to, and find your verdict. So as I've already said before, this enables you to have like a constant time evaluation of rules rather than linearly scaling. So this is a comparison of an F tables and IP tables from our nice colleagues at Red Hat. And you can see with the amount of chain jumps, the purple line, the throughput of the firewall is going down. But with an F tables where you're using data structures, the throughput is staying at the same level, irregardless of how many actual branches you have, right? For, uh, how many combinations you have to check. So another example is, uh, let's imagine we had two VMs on two different bridges and the host is like routing between those bridges. Um, we can then look at our hooks and this is really interesting because it shows how traffic flows through the net filter stack and the different hooks. Because here there's suddenly two tables involved, right? Because the traffic is originating from a bridge, is getting routed through the host and then going back into the bridge on another bridge. So you can see um, in the bridge tables it's check, okay, is it going on the same bridge or not? In this case, no. So it enters the input chain of the bridge then it enters the host, the host check, okay, is this local or should I forward this packet? I should forward it, so it's going into the forward chain and so on until it lands on the other bridge again. So this really shows how traffic flows through the different NF tables hooks. And clever choice of hooks for your firewall rules can make your life a lot easier or a lot harder depending on how well you choose them. In this case, if we want to firewall route the traffic, uh, there's two options, maybe forward hook is great, but then you also get uh, traffic that the host is just forwarding, maybe if he's acting as a router for something else. There's also the output hook, uh, in this case is also getting traffic that's flowing from the host itself to the bridge, so you have to decide for your own use case. And then we can just do the same principle, but in this case, we use the bridges, the input bridge name or the output bridge name. We could, of course, use tab interfaces. And in my examples, I've mainly used interface names. But of course, that breaks down. If you have like multiple nodes in a cluster and you have traffic flowing between multiple nodes, then you usually don't have the information of interface names. But I thought this would be a lot more instructive than having IP addresses plastered everywhere. But of course, you can always use IP addresses or MAC addresses or whatever identifier you want to use. And one last example is for north-south traffic. So um, it gets routed almost the same, but rather than entering the bridge table again, it just goes to egress, right? Because the traffic, instead of flowing to another bridge or another VM, is going to the internet. And one thing that's interesting, you can do uh, connection limits. So when, using, when doing stateful firewalling, the host and all the guests are sharing the same uh, contract table. And that's an issue because space is finite in the contract table. 
So for instance, a malicious guest could establish a lot of new connections at the same time and then flood the contract table and do a denial of service attack on the host. So we want to be able to limit how many connections a guest could make either uh, at the same time, you can put some limit, or you can do like an absolute limit, like you can do at most 20 connections. And we've talked about sets, you can, you can define the sets, and you can also from externally insert new elements into the set. But what if you could update a set from the rules itself? So there's a nice keyword called dynamic. And if you add it to the definition of the set, then you can write rules that update the set itself from the rule. So the magic keyword here is add, and my con limit is just the set name. And this rule is basically syntactic sugar for add the source address of this packet to the my con limit set. Uh, if the contract count is over 20, so it's contextual if you're specifying the IP source address, then it will only count the connections that have the same source address. And if the connect contract count is over 20, or the source address is contained in the set, then we drop the packet. And that way you can limit how many connections a VM can make at the same time. And since I spent some time messing with my HDMI adapter, I'll just really shortly talk about bandwidth limit and then we'll get to Rust, I promise. Um, you can do the same for bandwidth limit, of course. So if you wanted to limit the bandwidth of VMs, uh, it's the same principle. You update, from the, you update the set from the rule path, uh, insert the interface name and rate limit, how much traffic is going out. And one neat feature here is you can add groups to uh, tap devices, for instance. So let's say you had a VM with multiple tap interfaces but wanted to add a bandwidth limit for uh, the VM as a whole, for all interfaces of the VM together, then you can uh, add those interfaces to a group. IP uh, provides the functionality of grouping interfaces together and then match on the group instead. So that's a very convenient feature for grouping interfaces together and then writing rules that affect all the interfaces. Okay. NF tables and Rust. So, of course, as I've said before, hypervisor can be a very dynamic environment. So we need like a daemon or something that creates the rule for us dynamically. We do not want to be typing NF tables commands all the time. So uh, Rust is a very good suit for that. And the secret sauce is the JSON interface of NF tables. So everything I've showed you so far, every command, Every rule, every statement has a JSON representation. So on the left, you can see an NF tables command. And on the right, you can see the respective uh, JSON representation of that command. And um, some of you might know Rust. It has a quite powerful type system. So what if we took the JSON schema and modeled it in the Rust type system? So here you can see the outermost JSON. You define an enum that contains all add commands. Then you have like an add command for adding a table. And then of course the information that you need to add a table. And that's really powerful because by modeling the whole JSON schema in the Rust type system, we can write stuff like this. So if we wanted to execute an F tables command, we could, uh, create an object like this, so add the table and then some add table information and we want to add a table that's, in the, that's of the type init and call test. And suddenly you get um, co compile time checked and F tables commands and compile time checked firewall rules for free if you encode it in the type system properly. And if you have a command like this, you just serialize it to JSON and it emits the exact JSON that is necessary for executing that command or creating the rule and so on. And that's really convenient because firewalls are of course safety critical and it's really nice if the compiler is constantly checking if the rules you are writing are actually valid. 
so you don't get any surprises at runtime. And now that we are equipped with that, we can write a firewall daemon that is uh, looking at the events from the hypervisor. So let's say there's a new network interface added or a network interface removed, or there's some update to the rule set. The firewall daemon is collecting all those events and then emitting the respective NF tables commands. And since we have um, partial and atomic updates, we only ever have to touch the respective part of the rule set that is responsible for this. Either we are like inserting into a set or removing from a set or only rewriting one specific chain. Great. So just uh, the source for the uh, performance comparison from the guys from Red Hat. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs>